the order for morning prayer daily throughout the year. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Jesus, be thou our teacher. Let us confess our sins for Almighty God. Mighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left things undone that we should have done and not done things we should have done. There is no health in us apart from you. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind. In Christ Jesus our Lord, grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desires not the death of his people, but that they should turn from their wickedness and live, has given assurance that he pardons and absolves all those who truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us ever beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord, open thou our lips and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the day of provocation and in the day of wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works. Forty years long was I grieved with that generation. It is a people that do in their hearts, and they have not understood my ways. And whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. Psalm 26, verse 10. For in their hands is maliciousness, and their right hand is full of bribes. The Hebrew word zamo signifies properly an inward stratagem or device. 
here it is not improperly applied to the hands, as David wished to intimate that the wicked, of whom he was speaking, not only secretly imagined the seats, but also executed with their hands the malice which their heart devised. When the farther says their right hand are full of bribes, we may infer from this that it is not the common people whom he pointed out, but the nobility themselves. They were the most guilty of practicing this corruption. Although the common and baser sort of men may be hired for reward and suborned as agents of wickedness, yet we know that bribes are offered chiefly to judges and other great men who are in power. We likewise know that at the time referred to here, the worst of men bore sway. It is no wonder then that David complained that justice was exposed for sale. We are further admonished by this expression that those who delight in gifts can scarcely do otherwise than sell themselves to iniquity. nor is it vain unquestionably that God declares gifts blind, gifts blind in the eyes of the wise and pervert the hearts of the righteous. <coughs> and now our work on Deuteronomy, the suzerainty pattern, such substantially as the outline of Deuteronomy. Excuse me, there's some goofy things going on here. Preamble, Covenant Mediator, number one. Two, Historical Prologue, Covenant History. Three, The Stipulations of Covenant Life, 5 through 26. Four, Curses and Blessings, Covenant Ratification, 27 to 30. Five successive succession arrangements, covenant continuity. So let me continue to think back through. And now we continue our work on Leviticus. The tentativeness of all attempts to discover sources in Leviticus must be underlined. Even if one admits their presence, it does not necessarily follow that they ever circulated independently of each other. Analyses that purport to distinguish between an original source and the work of later redactors should be treated more warily still. We do not know enough about the development of Hebrew language, law, and religion to make the elaborate analyses offered in some works anything more than mere conjectures. It could be said about a lot of theological writing, elaborate constructions. And now for Judges 16, 7 through 11. I'm sorry, Joshua. I'm sorry again, Judges 16, Genesis 16, 7 through 11, thir uh, 13 and following. In the angel, Hagar recognized God manifesting himself to her. The presence of Jehovah called him called him, Thou art a God of seeing. For she said, Have I also seen here after seeing? Believing that a man must die if he saw God, Hagar was astonished that she had seen God and remained alive, and called Jehovah, who had spoken to her, God of seeing, who allows himself to be seen, because here on the spot for this sight was granted her after seeing still she saw remaining alive. 
From this occurrence, the well-received name of the well of seeing alive, which a man saw God and remained alive. They are Lahai Roy, according to Ewald. I a lot low. I row is to be regarded as a composite noun, and the Lee is a sign of the genitive. But this explanation in which Rawi is treated as a plausible form of Rai does not suit the form Rai with the accent of the last syllable. On this ground, Delich and others have decided in favor of the interpretation given in the Chalde version. Thou art a god of seeing, the all-seeing, from whose all-seeing the eye, the helpless and forsaken, is not hidden, even in the farthest corner of the desert. Have I not even here, in the barren land of solitude, looked after him who saw me? And to hear Laha Roy, the well of the living one who sees me, of the omnipresent providence, the still greater lies in the way of the view. It not only overthrows the close connection between this and similar passages where the sight of God excites the fear of death, but it renders the name which will be well received from this appearance of God an inexplicable riddle. If Hagar called God who appeared to her al Rai, where she looked after him whom he saw, as we must necessarily understand the word, saw not his face, but his back. How could it ever occur to her or anyone else to call the well, the hair lot, the high roy, well of the living one who sees me, instead of Bayer El Roy? Moreover, what completely overthrows this explanation is the fact that neither in Genesis nor anywhere in the Pentateuch is God called the living one. Throughout the Old Testament, it is in contrast with the dead gods or the idols of the heathen. The contrast never thought here with the expression Elohim Hai and El Hai occur while wow. I guys never used in the Old Testament that is the name of God. We turn now to Judges chapter nine. The more judgment action on the Bimelech crowd. The Shechemites had held a similar festival in the temple of their covenant of Baal and in his honor to that which the law prescribes for the Israelites. 9.28.29 At this feast, Gaal called the Shechemites to revolt from Abimelech. Who is Abimelech, he explained, who Shechem, that we serve him. Is he not the son of Barabbal, Zebel, his officer? Serve the men of Hamar, the father of Shechem, why should we why should we serve Abimelech? The meaning of these words, which have been misinterpreted in several different ways, is easily seen if we bear in mind number one, me, who is in this double question, cannot possibly be used in two different and altogether opposite senses, such as how insignificant or contemptible is Abimelech. And how great and mighty is Shechem, but that in both instances it must be expressive of disparagement and contempt. Number two, that Gale answers his own questions. Abimelech was regarded as contemptible, not because he was the son of a maidservant of low birth, low birth, but because he was ambitious and cruel parasite and murderer of his brethren. 
but because he was the son of Jer Jerubel, the son of a man who destroyed the altar of Baal at Shechem and restored the worship of Jehovah for which the Shechemites themselves had endeavored to slay him. So also the meaning of the question, who is Shechem, may be gathered from the answer and Zebel, his officer. The use of the personal me in relation to Shechem may be explained on the ground that Gale is speaking not so much of the city as of the inhabitants. The might and greatness of Shechem did not consist in the might and authority of the prefect Zebo, who had been appointed by Abimelech and whom the Shechemites had no need to serve. Accordingly, there is no necessity either for the arbitrary phrase of Shechem given in the Septuagint, namely, Huya Sukem, the son of Shechem, or for the perfectly arbitrary assumption of Berto, that Shechem is only the second name for Abimelech, who is a descendant of Shechem, or even the solution proposed by Rosenmuller, that Zebel was a man of low birth and obscure origin, which is quite incapable of proof. Hamer was the name of the Hivite prince who had founded the city of Shechem. That's positively tiring. Now we turn to Isaiah 9, 1 through 9. In the Messianic government, there is safety and security. Christ, the great shepherd, shall take care of his flock, that those who would hurt them shall not. They shall not only destroy one another, but no enemy from without shall be permitted to give them any molestation. The property of troubles and of death itself shall also be so altered that they shall not do any real hurt to, much less shall they be the destruction of any that have conversation in the holy mountain. Who or what can harm us if we are followers of him that is good? God's people shall be delivered not only from evil, but from the fear of it. Paul does so when he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? O death, where is thy sting. And now we turn to the New Testament as we're looking at Jehannan literature on the Logos. Hoskins drew attention to the way in early Christian thought tended to equate the word proclaimed with Christ himself. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you, with the parallel Ephesians 3.17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. But through faith, the word became a technical term for the Christian gospel, and the content of that word was Jesus himself. John draws the identification elsewhere. He quotes the affirmations of Jesus that he is the way, the use of the way, and that he is the resurrection. Paul preached Jesus and the resurrection. Alongside, if you continue in my word, can be placed, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. It is a short step from here to the direct statement that Jesus is the word. Now for Prof. Jameson on the healing of the two blind men. And a dumb demoniac healed. Uh, these, are, these two miracles are recorded by Matthew alone, the two blind men. 
When Jesus departed from thence, two blind men followed, hearing doubtless, as in the later cases expressed, Jesus passed by, crying, and saying, Thou, Son of David, have mercy on us. It is remarkable that in the other recorded case, it was the blind applied to Jesus for their sight and obtained it. They addressed him over and over again by this one messianic title so well known, Son of David. Can there be doubt that their faith fastened on such great messianic promises as this? Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Isaiah 35, 5. And if so, the appeal to him as the consolation of Israel to do his predicted office would fall with great weight upon the ears of Jesus. And when he came into the house to try their faith and patience, he seems to have made them no answer. But the blind men came to him with no doubt was what he desired. And Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Doubtless our Lord's design was not only to put their faith to the test by the question, but to deepen it, to raise their expectation of a cure, and so prepare them to receive it. And the cordial acknowledgement, so touchingly simple, which they immediately made of his power to heal them, shows how entirely the object was gained. One can hear the liberals choking. Now for Isaiah, I'm sorry, Acts 1, 15 to 26. The sin of Judas was not only his shame and ruin, but made a vacancy in the college of the apostles. They were ordained twelve, with an eye to the twelve tribes of Israel, descended from the twelve patriarchs. They were the twelve stars that made up the church's crown, and for them twelve thrones were designated, Matthew 19, 28. Now being twelve, they were learners. If there were eleven when they were <coughs> to be teachers, it would be occasion everyone to inquire what had become of the twelve, and to revive the remembrance of the scandal of their society. And therefore care was taken before the descent of the Spirit to fill up the vacancy of doing that which we now of which we have an account. Our Lord probably having given directions about it, among other things which he spoke pertaining to the kingdom of heaven. Very nice, as usual. Straight talk. Now for Romans 6, 16 and 17 with Prof Hodge. The language and construction are here nearly the same as in verse 13. Here, as there, we have parastamata in the sense of giving up to the power and disposal of. Paul says that those who give themselves up to another as to us, ace, rupa, guain, slaves to obedience, are the douloi of him whom they thus obey. It enters into the idea of slavery that the subjection is absolute and continued. A slave does not obey his own will, but his master's. He is subject not for a time, but for life. He is under an influence which secures obedience. This is as true in spiritual as in external relations. He who serves sin is the slave of sin. He is under its power. He cannot free himself from its dominion. He may hate its bondage. His reason and conscience may protest against it. His will may resist it, but he is still constrained to obedience. 
This is the doctrine of our Lord as taught in John 8, 34. He that committeth sin is the slave of sin. This remains true, although the service is unto death. The wages of sin is death. A death intended is spiritual and eternal. It is the absolute loss of the life of the soul, which consists in the favor and fellowship of God. What is true of sin is true of holiness. He who, by virtue of union with Christ, is made obedient to God, becomes, as Paul says, a doulos, hupakues, a slave of obedience. Obedience personifies the master to whom he is now subject. He is not only bound to obey, but he is made to obey in despite of the resistance of his still imperfectly sanctified nature. He cannot but obey. The point of analogy to which the reference is here made is cert the certainty of the effect and constraining influence of which the effect is secured. In the case of both sin and holiness, obedience is certain and is rendered certain by a power superior to the will of man. The great difference is that in the one case this subjection is abnormal and destructive, but the other normal and beneficent. A wise man is free in being subject to his reason. The more absolute and constant the authority of reason, the more exalted and free the soul. In like manner, the more completely that God reigns in us, the more completely are we subject to his will. So much the more are we free. Servants' obedience unto righteousness, dikais une, must here be taken in a subjective sense. It is inward righteousness or holiness. And in this sense, it is eternal life and therefore antithetical to thanatos, which is spiritual and eternal death. The service of sin results in death. The service of God results in righteousness. That is in our being right, completely conformed to the image of God in which the life of God consists verse 17 but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin but now ye have obeyed from the heart as it is the apostle's object to show that believers cannot live in sin inasmuch as they have become servants of another master he applies the general truth stated in the preceding verses more directly to his immediate readers and gives thanks that they, being emancipated from their former bondage, are now bound to a master whose service is perfect liberty. The expression is the first member of this verse is somewhat unusual. Although the sense is plain, God be thanked, that ye were the servants of sin, that is, that slavery is past, for God be thanked that ye, being servants of sin, have obeyed. Ye have obeyed from the heart. This obedience is voluntary and sincere. It had not been passively transferred from one master another, another. But the power of sin being broken, they gladly renounced that body and gave themselves up to God. Now we turn to Anaxagoras. Anaxagoras expressed his philosophy in a book, but only fragments remain. These appear to be confined to the first part of the work. We owe the preservation of the fragments to Simplicius, A.D. 6th century. Anaxagoras, like M. Pedocles accepted the theory of Parmenides that being neither comes into being nor passes away, but is unchangeable. 
the Hellenes do not understand rightly coming into being and passing away. Nothing comes into being or passes away. There is a mingling and a separation of things which are. Both thinkers are in agreement as to the indestructibility of matter and both reconcile the theory with the evident fact of change by postulating indestructible material articles. Particles, the mingling of which forms objects, the separation of which explains the passing away of objects. But Anaxagoras will not, with Empedocles, will not agree with him that ultimate units are particles corresponding to the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. He teaches that everything which has parts qualitatively the same as the whole which is ultimate and underived. Aristotle calls these wholes, which have qualitatively similar parts, ta amai o mere, ta amoi meres, being opposed to an amoi meres. This distinction is not difficult to grasp if one takes an example. If we suppose that a piece of gold is cut in half, the halves are themselves gold. The parts are thus qualitatively the same as the whole, and the whole can be said to be amoy maris. If, however, a dog, a living organism, be cut in half, the halves are not themselves two dogs. The whole is, in this case, therefore anamoy maris. The general notion is thus clear and it is unnecessary to confuse the issue by introducing considerations from modern scientific experiment. Some things have quali qualitatively similar parts, and such things are ultimate and underived. How can hair come from what is not hair, or flesh from what is not flesh? But it does not follow that everything which seems to be amoy maris is really so. Thus it is related by Aristotle that Anaxagoras did not hold Empedocles' elements, earth, air, fire, and water, to be really ultimate, and on the contrary they are mixtures composed of many qualitatively different particles. All of that is perfectly clear, is it not? Number four, canoticism. <clears throat> At least two broad areas of distinction can be made in understanding the potential range of canotic theories. First is the crucial distinction of the relation of a proposed canonic theology to the history of Christology is the theory to be seen as an alternative existing document, dogma, foresight, Macintosh, Macintosh, or a reinforcing modification, Garvey, Weston. Secondly, is a canonic theory to be seen in its uniqueness as the act of divine self-limitation foresight? Or is it to be seen either as either the culminating historical instance of the Trinitarian dialectic Garvey and or the canonic relation of God to creation in general? The common doctrine on the subject includes the following. A cause is something. 
It has real existence. It is not merely a name for a certain relation. It is a real entity. If that which does not exist can be a cause, then nothing can produce something which is a contradiction. To a cause must not only be something real, but it must have power or efficacy. There must be something in its nature to account for the effects which it produces. Three, this efficiency must be adequate. It is sufficient and appropriate to the subject. This is the true view of the nature of cause is, pl is plain. One from our own consciousness. We are causes. We can produce effects. And all three of the particulars above mentioned are included in our consciousness of ourselves as causes. We are real existences. We have power. We have power adequate to the effects which we produce. We can appeal to the universal consciousness of men. All men attach the meaning of the word cause in their ordinary language. All men assume that every effect has an antecedent to whose efficiency it is due. They never regard mere antecedents, however uniform in the past, or however certain in the future, as constituting a causal relation. The succession of the seasons have been uniform in the past, and we are confident they will continue uniform in the future. Yet no man says that the winter is the cause of summer. Everyone is conscious that cause expresses an entirely different relation from that antecedent. This view of the nature of causation is included in the universal and necessary belief that every effect must have a cause. That belief is not that one thing must always go before another but that nothing can occur, that no change can be produced without the exercise of power or efficiency somewhere. This, this subject is discussed by all the metaphysicians from Aristotle downwards, and especially since the promulgation of the new doctrine adopted by Hume. It is one of the great services rendered by Dr. Makash to the cause of truth that he has defended the authority of those primary beliefs which lie at the foundation of knowledge. Now for Bob Berkhoff on the final judgment. The nature of the final judgment, the final judgment of which the Bible speaks, may not be regarded as a spiritual, indivisible, invisible, and endless process. Which is identical with God's providence in history. This is not equivalent to the denial of the fact that there is a providential judgment of God in the vicissitudes of individuals and nations, though it may not always be recognized as such. The Bible clearly teaches us that God, even in this present life, visits evil with punishment and rewards the good with blessings, and these punishments and rewards or in some cases positive, but in other cases appear as the natural providential results of the evil committed or the good done. Deuteronomy 9.5, Psalm 9.16, 37.28, Proverbs 11.5, 14.11, Isaiah 32.16 and 17. And Lamentations 5 7. The human conscience also testifies to this fact, but it is also manifest from Scripture that the judgments of God in the present are not final. The evil sometimes continues without due punishment, 
and the good is not always rewarded with the promised blessings in this life. The wicked in the days of Malachi were emboldened to cry out, Where is the God of judgment? Malachi 2.17 The complaint was heard in those days, It is vain to serve God. And what profit is there that we have kept his charge, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts, and now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are built up. Yea, they that tempt God and escape. Malachi 3, 14 and 15. Job and his friends were wrestling with the problem of sufferings of the righteous. And so was Asaph in the 73rd Psalm. The Bible teaches us to look forward to a final judgment as the decisive answer of God to all such questions, as the solution of all such problems, and as the removal of all the apparent discrepancies of the present. Matthew 25, 31 to 46, John 5, 27 to 29, Acts 25, 24, Romans 2, 5 through 11, Hebrews 9, 27, Hebrews 10, 27, 2 Peter 3, 7, Revelation 20, 11 to 15. These passages do not refer to a process, but to a very definite event at the end of time. It is represented as accompanied by other historical events, such as the coming of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, and the renewal of heaven and earth. And now we begin with our ever clear Robert Raymond on the New Testament illustrations of God's sovereignty and eternal decree. He just did a crackerjack job in the Old Testament. It's just utterly exquisite. The New Testament is even more didactically explicit than the Old in its insistence upon God's sovereignty over life and salvation. Number one, Jesus teaches that the minutest occurrences are directly controlled by his Heavenly Father. It is he who feeds the birds of the air, Matthew 6.26, clothes the field with flowers, Matthew 6.28, not a sparrow is forgotten by God or falls to the ground apart from his will. And the very number of the hairs on our heads are numbered. Matthew 10, 29. Immediately after being rejected by the cities of Galilee, Jesus said, Pray, I praise you, Father in heaven, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and have revealed them unto babes and pleasure. Yes, Father, it was your good will. Matthew eleven twenty five and 26. Number three, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up by the roots. Matthew 15, 13. On another occasion, Jesus expressly taught that no one can come to him unless the Father savingly acts in his behalf. John 6, 44 and 45. No one can come unto me unless the Father who has sent me draw me, draws him. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught of God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. John 6, 65, no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. Number five, in the same vein, Jesus declared in his high priestly prayer in John 17. 
For you, Father, granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. John 17, 6, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. John 17, 9, I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. John 17, 12, none has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Number six, John traced Israel's rejection to God's work of blinding and hardening. For this reason, they could not believe. He blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts so that they could neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts in turn. John 12, 37 to 40. See Isaiah 6, 9. Mark 4, 11. Romans 9, 18 to 24. Here we see in the New Testament the same hardening doctrine that we noted in the Old Testament. Well, we finished with Basel the Great. And now for Gregory of Nyssa. Give me a moment here. of Nyssa, where are you? Well, we'll just start with Gregory the Sixth again. <clears throat> 540 to 604. Gregory the Great, Pope from 590. He was the fourth and last of the traditional Latin doctors of the church and father of the medieval papacy. The son of a senator, he became the prefect of the city in 573 at the age 33. But like many of the finer men of the age, he sold his vast property and devoted the proceeds to the relief of the poor. He founded seven monasteries, six in Sicily and one in Rome, which last he himself entered as a monk in 574. After a few years of a very austere life, the Pope compelled him to leave the cloister, creating him regenerius one of the seven deacons of Rome. Soon afterwards, Pelagius II made him Apocrisarius at the imperial court of Constantinople. His experiences there which convinced him that no help was to be expected from the struggling Eastern Empire largely influenced his future course of action as Pope. About 585, at age 45, he returned to Rome and became abbot of his monastery, St. Andrews. To this period probably belongs the famous story related by Bede of his encounters with the fair Saxon slaves in the market. No one only said on the leap. some discussion about the conversion of Paul. <clears throat> Dr. Bauer, the master spirit of skeptical criticism and founder of the Tübingen School, felt constrained shortly before his death <clears throat> in 1860. Good morning, Mary. We're reading here more on Paul's conversion. And Dr. Bauer, the Tübingen 
skeptic, or should we say decadent man. At the end of near his death, he abandoned the vision hypothesis to admit that no psychological or dialectic knowledge analysis can explore the inner mystery of the act of God, which was revealed in his son. In the same connection, he says that in the sudden transformation of Paul, the most violent adversary of Christianity, into its most determined herald, he could see nothing short of a miracle. And he adds, this miracle appears all the greater when we consider that in the revulsion of his consciousness, he broke through the barriers of Judaism and rose out of its particularism into the universalism of Christianity. This frank confession is credible to the head and heart of the late Tübingen critic, but it is fatal to the whole to his own whole anti-supernaturalist theory of history. See falsus in uno, falsus in omnibus. If false in one, false in all. If we admit the miracle in one case, the door is open for all the other miracles which rest upon equally strong evidence. The late Dr. Kime, an independent pupil of Bauer, admits at least the spiritual manifestations of the ascended Christ from heaven and urges in favor the objective reality of the Christophanies reported by Paul. The whole character of Paul, his sharp understanding, which was not weakened by his enthusiasm, the careful cautions measured in a simple form of his statement, above all that is favorable, the total impression of his narrative and the mighty echo of it in the unanimous, uncontradicted faith of primitive Christendom. Dr. Schenkel of Heidelberg, in the latest stage of development, says that Paul, with full justice, put his Christophany on par with the Christophanies of the older apostles. That all these Christophanies are not Christophanies are not simply the result of psychological processes but remain in many respects psychologically inconceivable and point to the historic background of the person of Jesus. And Paul was not an ordinary visionary but carefully distinguished the Christophany at Damascus from his later visions that he retained the full possession of his rational mind even in the moments of highest exaltation, that his conversion was not some sudden effect of nervous excitement, but brought about by the influence of divine providence, which quietly prepared his soul for the reception of Christ, and then the appearance of Christ vouchsafed to him, not a dream, but a reality. We turn now to the medieval, medieval period. We're talking about the general character of medieval morals of this period. We'll get around to talking about the clerical situation. The moral condition of the Middle Ages varied considerably. The migration of nations was most unfavorable to the peaceful work of the church. Then came the bright reign of Charlemagne with his noble efforts for education and religion, but it was soon followed by his weak successors by another period of darkness which grew worse and worse till a moral reformation began in the convent of Cluny and reached the papal chair under the head of Hildebrand. Yet if we judge by the number of saints in the Roman calendar, the seventh century, which is among the darkest, was more pious 
than any of the preceding and succeeding centuries, except the third and fourth, which is enriched by the mod martyrs. In the first centuries, the numerous nameless martyrs of the Neronian and other persecutions are not separately counted. The Holy Innocents, the Seven Sleepers in the third century, the 40 martyrs of Sabast in the 40th century, and other groups of martyrs are counted as only one. Lecky asserts too confidently that the 7th century was the most prolific in the saints, and yet the most immoral. It is strange that the number of saints should have declined from the 7th century, while the church increased in the 8th century in infidelity, should have produced five more saints than the 17th century. It would therefore be very unsafe to make this table the basis of general estimates. We'll pick up, God willing, tomorrow on an estimation of clerical morals in the medieval period. We now continue in this letter of John Kelvin. We've got several pages of it in small print. We break in here for the second section of it. Calvin is disarming Cardinal Sodalet, who has accused the reformers of being motivated by ambition and pride. Now for Calvin, that I might perceive these things, thou, O Lord, did shine upon me with the brightness of thy spirit that I might comprehend how impious and noxious they were. Thou didst bear before me the torch of thy word, that I might abominate them as they deserved. Thou didst stimulate my soul. But in rendering an account of my doctrine, thou seest, it's almost written like Augustine's Confessions as a prayer, what my own conscience declares that it was not my intention to stray beyond those limits which I saw had been fixed by all thy servants. Whatever I felt assured that I had learned from thy mouth, I desired to dispense faithfully to the church. Assuredly, the thing at which I chiefly aimed and for which I most diligently labored was that the glory of thy goodness and justice after dispis, dis, dispersing the mists by which it had been formerly obscured, might shine forth conspicuous, that the virtue and blessings of thy Christ, all glosses being wiped away, might be fully displayed. For I thought it impious to leave in obscurity things which were we were born to ponder and meditate, nor did I think that truths whose magnitude no language can express would be maliciously or falsely declared. I hesitated not to dwell at greater length on topics on which the salvation of my hearers depended, for the oracle could never deceive which declares, this is eternal life to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. As to the charge of forsaking the church, which they are wont to bring against me, there is nothing of which my conscience accuses me, unless indeed he is to be considered a deserter, who, seeing the soldiers routed and scattered, and abandoning the ranks, raises the leader's standard and recalls them to their posts. For thus, O Lord, were all thy servants dispersed, so that they could not by any possibility hear the command, but had almost forgotten their leader, their service, and their military oath. In order to bring them together, when thus scattered, I raise not a foreign standard, but the noble banner of thine, which we must follow, if we would be classed among thy people. Then I was assailed by those who, when they ought to have kept others in their ranks, had led them astray, 
and when I determined not to desist, they opposed me with violence. On, these, on this grievous tumult arose, the contest blazed and issued in disruption. With whom the blame rests, it is for thee, O Lord, to decide. Always both by word and deed have I protested how eager I was for unity. Mine, however, was for the unity of the church, which should begin with thee and end in thee. For as oft as thou didst recommend to us peace and concord, thou at the same time did show that thou wert, thou and thou only, were the bond of preserving it. We'll pick that up. He's writing that as a form of prayer to the Lord to show the, fal the falsity of Satellite's imputation. We're now on a page with Dr. Cranmer and Tulloch by McCulloch. We pick up there. While the Convocation of Canterbury was meeting, Cromwell was preparing injunctions which applied to the entire Church of England. He still drew on deliberation of convocation. They referred to its agreement in late July to the abolition of various holy days and also referred to the discussion of devotion to images in the Ten Articles of 1536. <clears throat> but they went beyond any general order so far in envisaging a basic program of Christian education cooperative effort between the parish clergy and heads of household to teach the Lord's Prayer, Creed, and Ten Commandments, in English, by the way. The most striking provisions was at the order by 1 August 1537, this side of the Feast of St. Peter and Ad Winkula next coming. Every parish priest should provide a copy of the Bible in Latin and English. This would be basically Tyndale's work, now dead. And since the only complete English Bible had been published by Miles Coverdale less than a year before, without official approval, and the bishop's own half-hearted moves to provide a translation had thus far produced no result. This was a curiously impractical trumpeting of evangelical idealism, and many later copies of the adjunctions omitted. Nevertheless, various bishops tried to follow it up with their own orders during 1537. The new relationship between Archbishop Cranmer and the Vice Gerent Cromwell was poignantly symbolized by Cranmer by another event of 1536. The first assault on the great estates of the Archdiocese of Canterbury. Monastic closures are going to start going on now to build up the position of Thomas Cromwell now needing an income to sustain his new dignity as a peer of the realm. For a millennium, the archbishopric had been the large archbishopric had been the largest landowner in Kent, the flagship of a clerical estate in a in a county where the church owned two fifths of the all the land. Beyond that, the archbishops had built up huge estates around London, reflecting their gradual establishment away from their Kentish base. To become the leader of the English church in the English capital. It was these Thames Valley lands which were first attacked in the interests of the Surrey Sherman's son, Putin, from Putin reference to Cromwell. These were 
there was the first parliamentary act exchanging states in February 1536. And Anne Boleyn sees all this going on and doesn't like it. She confronts Henry. Cranmer's not happy. Latimer's not happy. And they see the avarice and the greed that's going on. And then a further act, June 1536. By June 1536, Anne's head is off. Henry has remarried. And Cranmer's done his lapdog duties as a nullity sig signator. Cranmer surrendered his Surrey estates at Wimbledon and Mortlake. Cromwell took his baron's title from Wimbledon when he was created Lord Cromwell in July, a neatly symbolic transfer from the primate of all England to the layman, the vicegerent of Henry. In return, the archbishop got lands to the priory of St. Radegund near Dover. Radegund was a 4th century, uh, sorry, 14th century nun. This was the Episcopal bench's first experience with the unequal property exchanges that would become a feature of Henry VIII's relationship with his other bishops. It was also comparatively modest compared with what Cranmer would experience over the next decade, which was further despoliation, 800 monasteries of money going to the royal exchequer and into the hands of noblemen. Now for our section on confessing the faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Larger Westminster Confession, paragraph 9, chapter 9, I'm sorry, on free will, um, paragraph 2. Man in his state of innocency had freedom and power to will and to do that which is good and well-pleasing to God, yet mutably so that he might fall from it. And now for the Lutherans and the formula of Concord and the debates that they're having. I didn't, I've kind of forgotten how contentious things could be amongst the Lutherans. The autophoristic controversy, 1548. 1555, a diaphoristic, which means it doesn't matter, it's not important, a diaphora. The controversy is the subject of the 10th article of the Formula of Concord, but was the first in the order of time among the disputes which occasioned this confession. It arose soon after Luther's death in 1546 out of the unfortunate Schmalkald War, which resulted in the defeat of the Lutheran states and brought them for a time under the ecclesiastical control of Emperor Charles V and his Spanish and Romish advisors. Ecclesiastical rites and ceremonies, which are neither commanded nor forbidden in the scriptures, are in themselves indifferent adiaphora, media, race mediae, 
but the observance or non-observance of them under testing circumstances became a matter of principle and conscience. The Augsburg Confession and Apology, Article 7, declare that agreement in doctrine and the administration of the sacraments is sufficient for the unity of the church and may coexist with diversity and usages and rites of human origin, such as the prayer book for the Anglicans, uh, the directory of worship for the Scottish Presbyterians of human origin. Luther himself desired to retain many forms of the Catholic worship, which he considered innocent and beautiful, provided only that no merit be attached to them and no burden imposed upon the conscience. But there's a great difference between retaining old forms and restoring them after they had been abolished is also between a voluntary and a compulsory observance. And that would be a problem with the Anglicans who imposed that. The Presbyterians said, no, we want freedom. Now we turn to the infallibilists in paragraph 625 on the dissensus clause of the Apostles' Creed. He descended into hell which has occasioned significant discussion, although there's only one passage that gives hints at that. Christ went down into the depths of death so that the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. And we notice they've been skirting around here. Jesus, the author of life by dying, destroyed him who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and delivered all those who through fear of death were subject to a lifelong bondage. Henceforth, the risen Christ holds the keys of death and Hades or hell, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Now we've got a quotation from an ancient homily for Holy Saturday. Today, this would be, Holy Saturday would be the second day, the day after the resurrection, Jesus is in the grave. Today, a great silence reigns on the earth, a great silence and a great stillness. A great silence because the king is asleep. The earth trembled, and still, because God has fallen asleep in the flesh, and he has raised up all who have slept ever since the world began. He's gone to search for Adam, our first forefather, as for a lost sheep, greatly desiring to visit those who live in darkness. You can see uh, purgatory and this a state of darkness for the saints of the Old Testament. This is Rome talking, and in the shadow of death, he has gone to free from sorrow Adam in his bonds and Eve. He who is both their God and the son of Eve, I am your God, who for your sake have become your son. I order you, O sleeper, to awake. I did not create you to be a prisoner in hell. Rise from the dead, for I am the life of the dead. So Adam and Eve are in hell. That's a novel one. And a real fiction and fancy of somebody's sermonic mind. Paragraph 636, and we've noticed, we'll see if they get a little more clear here. They skirt around. By the expression, he descended into hell, a clause in the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed confesses that Jesus really did die, and through his death for us conquered death and the devil. 637, in his human soul, united to his divine person, the dead Christ went down to the realm of the dead. He opened heaven's gates for the just who had gone before him. 
they really don't deal with the issue. Let us turn to prayer. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save them that rule. Grant a renewal of humility and honesty in the media, in academy, in politics. Mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. And do thy ministers with righteousness, good doctrine, discernment, and love. Make thy chosen people joyful. Make them submit with greatness, with great determination to thy daily guidance and thy commandments. Teach us your statutes, O Lord. Make your people joyful even as we see darkness here and there. Bless thine inheritance and give peace in our time, O Lord. Give peace to Ukraine. Fight for us, O Lord, because you alone are our great commander, fleet marshal, and fleet admiral. O God, cleanse our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit. O Lord, from whom all good things do come, grant to us thy humble servants that by your inspiration we may think those things that are right and by your goodness and merciful guidance may perform the same. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, the knowledge of whom stands our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of another day, defend us today by thy mighty power, and grant that we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by thy governance, may be righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty Father, whose kingdom is everlasting, we beseech thee of thy mercy to direct and prosper the consultations of those who bear authority in this nation, that there may be a new spirit of humility, integrity, and telling of the truth, better thinking, clear thinking, and the cessation of lies that we hear. Grant, we pray, a renewal of religion and godly piety, peace, gentleness, and truth, that these things may be established for the sake of our children and grandchildren. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, you alone work great marvels. Send down upon our pastors and the congregations committed to their charge the helpful spirit of thy grace, and that they may please thee, pour upon them the continued dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our only advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. We pause, O Lord, to offer spontaneous prayers, spoken and unspoken. We remember Dave, his loss of his wife, for Dr. Bob and his exams, for Linda and the medical issues coming forward, for Donnie, for another David, for our families, wives and husbands, our children and grandchildren, our wider family our church family, our friends.
Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee. Thus promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill thou, Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth and in the world to come life everlasting. Amen. If the Lord be for us, who could be against us? In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, be with us and dominate this day entirely, today, tomorrow, and forever, world without end. Amen. Here ends the order for morning prayer. And good to see you, Matt and Mary. We got finished early today. We'll be pressing on shortly in our readings of theological journals and Cranmer studies and then evening prayer. So, Godspeed.